Thank you very, very warmly. Uh, I want to thank Professor Ryberg very much for this uh, very warm introduction. And I want to thank President Hallstrom very much for her uh, wonderful hospitality and her introduction. And particularly to thank the whole of the Academy for this invitation and for the chance to visit uh, Denmark, which I've done not as often as I would like to do. So, so it's a beginning, I hope, of a longer relationship. At the end of Aeschylus's Oresteia, two transformations take place in the archaic world of the characters. One is famous, the other often neglected. In the famous transformation, the goddess Athena introduces legal institutions to re replace and terminate the seemingly endless cycle of blood vengeance setting up a court of law with established procedures of reasoned argument and the weighing of evidence, and a jury selected from the citizen body of Athens, Athena announces that blood guilt will now be settled by law rather than by the Furies, ancient goddesses of revenge. But, and this is part and parcel of her famous transformation of the Athenian community, the Furies are not simply dismissed. Instead, Athena persuades them to join the city, giving them a place of honor beneath the earth in recognition of their importance for those same legal institutions and the future health of the city. Typically, this move of Athena's is understood to be a recognition that the legal system must incorporate the dark vindictive passions and honor them. The suggestion is that resentment itself remains unaltered it simply has a new house built around it. The Furies agree to accept the constraints of law, but they retain an unchanged nature, dark and vindictive. That reading, however, ignores the second transformation, a transformation in the nature and demeanor of the Furies themselves. At the outset of the drama, the Furies are described as repulsive and horrifying. They're said to be black, disgusting, their eyes drip a hideous liquid. The god Apollo depicts them as vomiting up clots of blood that they've ingested from their prey. They belong, he says, in some barbarian tyranny where it's customary to kill people arbitrarily and to torture them. Nor, when they awaken, do the Furies give the lie to these grim descriptions. As Clytemnestra's ghost summons them, they don't even speak but they simply moan and whine, noises characteristic of animals. So in the manuscripts, it says mugmos and oigmos, which are animal noises. And then later, when they start to speak, their only words are, get him, get him, get him, get him, get him, as close to a predator's hunting cry as the genre allows. As Clytemnestra says, in your dream, you pursue your prey, and you bark like a hunting dog hot on the trail of blood. If the Furies are later given articulate speech, as of course the genre demands, we are never to forget this initial characterization. What Aeschylus has done here is to depict unbridled resentment. It is obsessive, destructive, existing only to inflict pain and ill. As the distinguished 18th century philosopher Bishop Butler observes, no other principle or passion hath for its end the misery of our fellow creatures. In its zeal for blood, it is somehow subhuman, and Apollo's idea is this rabid breed belongs somewhere else in some society that does not try to moderate cruelty. Unchanged, then, these furies could not be part and parcel of a working legal system in a society committed to the rule of law. You don't put wild dogs in a cage and come out with justice. But the Furies do not, in fact, make the transition to democracy unchanged. Until quite late in the drama, they are still their bestial selves, threatening to disgorge their venom on the land. Then, however, Athena persuades them to alter themselves so as to join her enterprise. Lull to repose the bitter force of your black wave of anger, she says. But of course, that means a very profound inner transformation. Indeed, a virtual change of identity. So deeply bound up are they with anger's obsessive force. 
She offers them incentives to join the city, a place of honor beneath the earth, reverence from the citizens, but the condition of this honor is that they become human, not totally taken up with retribution, but able to adopt a new range of sentiments, and in particular, benevolent sentiments toward the entire city. They must also refrain, she says, from stirring up anger within it. The deal is that if they do good and they have and express kindly intentions, they will receive good treatment and be honored. Perhaps most fundamentally transformative of all, they must listen to the voice of persuasion. All of this, needless to say, is not just external containment, it is a profound inner reorientation. They accept her offer and express themselves with gentle tempered intent. Each, they declare, should give generously to each in what they call a mindset of common love. Not surprisingly, they're transformed physically in related ways. They apparently assume an erect posture for the procession that concludes the drama, and they receive crimson robes from citizen women who serve as their escorts. So, they've become women rather than beasts. Their very name is changed. They're now called the kindly ones, Eumenides, rather than the Furies. Now, this second transformation is just as significant as the first one, indeed crucial to the success of the first one. Aeschylus shows that political justice does not simply put a cage around resentment, it fundamentally transforms it from something hardly human, obsessive, bloodthirsty, to something human, accepting of reasons, calm, deliberate, and measured something that protects life rather than inflicting pain upon it. The indignation that inhabits just institutions is not an angry sentiment at all. It's a measured judgment in defense of life. The Furies are still needed in a way, because this is an imperfect world and there will always be crimes to deal with. But they are not wanted or needed in their original shape and form. Indeed, they're not their old selves at all. They've become instruments of justice and welfare. The city is liberated from the scourge of vindictive anger, which produces civil strife and premature death. In the place of anger, the city gets forward-looking justice. It's no accident that the major Greco-Roman philosophers from Socrates to Seneca were strong opponents of retributivism in the criminal law and defenders of a welfare-based deterrent conception of punishment. Another liberation goes unexplored, but invites our imaginations. It is the liberation of the private realm. In the old world of the Furies, the family and love, familial and friendly, were burdened by the continual need to avenge something for someone. The need for retaliation was unending, and it shadowed all relationships, including the apparently benign relationship of Orestes with his sister Electra. But now, law takes over the task of dealing with crime, leaving the family free to be a place of reciprocal goodwill. It's not that there are no more occasions for anger, but if they are serious, including crimes in the family, they're turned over to law, and if they're not serious, why should they long trouble reciprocal concern? As Aristotle will later say, a gentle-tempered person, his name for the virtue in the area of anger, but notice it's the name that Aeschylus uses, is not vengeful, but instead is inclined to sympathetic understanding. So law gives a double benefit. It keeps us safe on the outside, and it permits us to care for one another, unburdened by retributive anger on the inside. So that's my normative idea in a nutshell, but it's radical and evokes strong opposition. For anger, with all its ugliness, is a very popular emotion. Many people think that it's impossible to care for justice without anger at injustice, and that anger should therefore be encouraged as part of the transformative process. Many also believe that it's impossible for individuals to stand up for their own self-respect without anger, that someone who reacts to wrongs and insults without anger is spineless and downtrodden. 
women in particular are often urged to tap into our own hidden anger and to see this search for suppressed anger as part of a personal struggle for self-respect. Moreover, many people also believe that getting angry when someone else does something wrong is essential to taking that person seriously. So if you wrong me and I don't get angry at you, I'm treating you condescendingly, like a child and a non-responsible person. I used to think in a number of those things. Nor are those ideas confined to the sphere of personal relations. The most popular position in the sphere of criminal justice, uh, criminal justice scholarship today, is retributivism, the view that the law ought to punish aggressors in a manner that embodies the spirit of justified anger. And it's also very widely believed that successful challenges against great injustice need the spirit of anger to make progress. So anger is at the heart of revolutionary transformation. Still, we may take courage from the fact that recent years have seen three noble and successful freedom movements all conducted in the spirit of non-anger. Those of Mohandas Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Nelson Mandela. Surely people who stood up for their self-respect and that of others and who did not acquiesce in injustice. Now notice that I'm saying non-anger, not non-violence. Gandhi also espoused pretty total non-violence. King granted that violence in self-defense is permissible, but he urged total non-violence for strategic reasons. Mandela, of course, turn from nonviolence to violence for his own strategic reasons when nonviolence had failed. But he never wavered in his commitment to non-anger, and I'm going to return to this point later. So I'm now going to argue that a close philosophical analysis of the emotion of anger can help us support these philosophies of non-anger, showing why anger is fatally flawed from a normative viewpoint, sometimes incoherent and sometimes based on bad values. In either of these two cases, it's a dubious value in both life and the law. So I'll first present the general view and then show its relevance to thinking well about revolutionary justice. Let's begin with Aristotle's definition of anger, which commands pretty wide agreement in the Western philosophical tradition, although it certainly needs to be modified in some respects. So Aristotle says, anger is a response to a significant damage to something or someone that one cares about and a damage that the angry person believes to have been wrongfully inflicted. He adds that although the anger itself is painful, it also contains within itself a pleasant hope for payback or rectification of some sort. So significant damage, pertaining to one's own values or circle of cares and wrongfulness, those two elements seem, I think, both true and uncontroversial. And they've been validated by modern psychological studies of the emotion. More controversial, perhaps, is the idea that the angry person wants and hopes for some type of retribution and that this is a conceptual part of what anger itself is. Now, in fact, all Western philosophers known to me who talk about anger do include this wish for retribution as a conceptual element in anger, but we still need to pause because it's not obvious. Now, we should understand that the wish for retribution can be a very subtle wish. The angry person doesn't need to wish to take revenge herself. She may simply want the law to do so or even some type of divine justice, so, so Gandhi mentions that possibility. Or she may more subtly simply want the wrongdoer's life to go really badly in future, hoping, let's say, that that second marriage of your betraying ex turns out really badly. <laughs> now, I think that if we un understand the wish in this broad way, Aristotle is right. Anger does contain a sort of payback wish, and this is what differentiates itself, it from other related emotions like compassionate grieving. Contemporary psychologists who study anger empirically agree with Aristotle in seeing this double movement in it from pain to hope. An example will help. 
Suppose a wrongdoer has murdered Angela's child. She does, of course, feel enormous grief and loss. But suppose she's angry at the murderer, as she's very likely to be. What's that emotion all about? It isn't just sadness at the loss, since its focus is on the wrongfulness of the act. But still, is it just sadness that a wrongful act has occurred and a wish that it had not occurred? If that's all she feels, then I think we still would not call her emotion anger. It would be a special species of grief. But then, what is it that makes the emotion anger? And I think Aristotle's right, it is the wish for some type of retribution, however subtle, and I'm going to come back to this. But first, one more thing that Aristotle says is not quite right. He says anger is always a response not to any old wrongful damage, but only to the type that he calls a down-ranking. Now, that doesn't seem to be true all the time. I can get angry at wrongs done to others without thinking of them as lowering my social rank. I can even get angry at violations of principles that I care about. Still, let's hold on to Aristotle's focus on relative status, for it does cover surprisingly many cases of anger, as empirical researchers discover and emphasize, and it can help us make sense of some puzzling things that we'll get to shortly. Now, we're ready to begin seeing what's normatively problematic about anger. The central issue is this. The payback idea does not make sense. Ideas of cosmic balance are extremely widespread and archaic, and almost all of us have them at some level. When wrong is done, we somehow think the universe will be off kilter unless there's a proportional rectification. The earliest known piece of written Western philosophy, a fragment of the Greek philosopher Anaximander in the 6th century BCE, says that human justice is like the cycle of the seasons. The hot and the cold pay penalty to one another, each by predominating for a while and then being squeezed out in their turn. So, this is something that people believe, whether because of their experience of the seasons or some other deep-seated tendency. But it just doesn't make sense in the world of human action. Whatever the wrong is that was done, a murder, a rape, inflicting pain on the wrongdoer does not actually restore the thing that was lost. As Aeschylus says, when a man's blood is spilt upon the ground, who can call it back again? We think about payback all the time and you know, pay back. It's human to think that proportionality between punishment and offense somehow makes good the offense. Only it doesn't. Let's say my friend has been raped. I urgently want the offender to be arrested, convicted, and punished. But really, what good will that do? Looking to the future, I might want many things to restore my friend's life, to prevent and deter future rapes, but harsh treatment of this particular wrongdoer might or might not achieve the latter goal. It's an empirical question. As Plato, rejecting Anaximander's archaic idea of punishment, already saw. And usually people don't treat it as an empirical matter. They are in the grip of an idea of cosmic fitness that makes them think that blood for blood, pain for pain, is the way that it must go. The payback idea is deeply human but fatally flawed as a way of making sense of the world. But now we can return to Aristotle's idea of down-ranking, for there is one, and I think only one, situation where the payback idea does make perfect sense. That is, when I see the wrong as entirely and only a down-ranking, that is, as entirely about relative status. If the problem is not the murder or rape itself, but the way it has affected my relative ranking in the social hierarchy, then I really can achieve something by humiliating the wrongdoer. By putting him relatively lower, I automatically do put myself relatively higher. And since relative status is all I'm assumed to care about in this hypothetical, I don't need to worry 
that the real well-being problems created by the wrongful act have not been addressed. In short, a wronged person who is angry, seeking to strike back, soon arrives, I claim, at a fork in the road. Three paths are open before her. Either she goes down the path of status, seeing the event as all about her and her relative rank, or she chooses the path of payback and imagines that the offender's suffering would actually make things better, a thought that doesn't make sense. Or if she is rational, after exploring and rejecting those two flawed roads, she will notice that a third path is open to her, which is the best of all. Namely, she can focus on doing whatever would make sense in the situation and be really helpful going forward. This may well include the punishment of the offender, but in a spirit that's forward-looking rather than merely retaliatory. But what's really wrong with the status path? Many societies do encourage people to think of all injuries as essentially about them and their own ranking. Life involves perpetual status anxiety, and more or less everything that happens to one either raises one's rank or lowers it. Aristotle's society, as he depicts it, was to a large extent like this, and he was very critical of this tendency on the grounds that obsessive focus on honor impedes the pursuit of intrinsic goods. The error involved in the status path, which I would say is at least as common in modern United States as it was in ancient Greece, is not silly or easily dismissed. Still, the tendency to see everything that happens as about oneself and one's own ranking seems very narcissistic and ill-suited to a society in which reciprocity and justice are important values. It loses the sense that actions have intrinsic moral worth, that the rape of my friend is bad because of the suffering it inflicts, not just because of the way it humiliates the friends of the victim. Even in the case where one is oneself the victim of rape or assault, it somehow seems off to view rape as bad simply because it lowers relative status rather than because it inflicts pain and trauma. If it were primarily a down ranking, it could be rectified by the humiliation of the offender. And many people certainly believe something like this. But isn't this thought a red herring diverting us from the reality of the victim's pain and trauma, which needs to be constructively addressed by attention to her. All sorts of bad acts, murder, assault, theft, need to be addressed as the specific acts they are. And their victims or the victim's families need constructive attention. None of this will be likely to happen if one thinks of the offense as all about relative status rather than about injury, pain, and loss. So, to put my radical claim succinctly, when anger makes sense, its retaliatory tendency is normatively problematic because it's focused narrowly on status. When it's normatively reasonable, focused on the actual injury or loss, its retaliatory tendency doesn't make sense and is normatively problematic in that way since we all would like to make sense. So, in a rational person, anger, realizing that, soon laughs at itself and goes away. From now on, I'll call this healthy segue into forward-looking thoughts and accordingly from anger into compassionate hope, the transition with a capital T. So it's a technical term as I'm using it. To clarify further what I mean by the transition, let me consider a case in which it takes a political form, thus introducing the topic of revolutionary justice. So let me look carefully at just one case, the sequence of emotions in Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. King believe, begins, indeed, with an Aristotelian summons to anger. He points to the wrongful injuries of racism which have failed to fulfill the nation's implicit promises of equality. One hundred years after Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, he says, quote, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and the chains of discrimination. The next move King makes is very significant, for instead of demonizing white Americans or portraying their behavior in terms apt to stoke murderous rage, 
He calmly compares them to people who have defaulted on a financial obligation. Quote, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds, end quote. So here's where the transition begins, for it makes us think ahead in non-retributive ways. The essential question is not how whites can be humiliated, but how can this debt be made good? And in the financial metaphor, the thought of killing or even humiliating the debtor is not likely to be central. The transition now gets underway in earnest, as King focuses on a future in which all may join together in pursuing justice and honoring obligations. Quote, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. We refuse to believe that there are insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity in this nation. So no mention again of torment or payback, only of determination to ensure the protection of civil rights at last. King reminds his audience that the moment is urgent and that there is a danger of anger spilling over, but he repudiates that in advance. Quote, in the process of gaining our rightful place, we must not be guilty of wrongful deeds. Let us not seek to satisfy our thirst for freedom by drinking from the cup of bitterness and hatred. Again and again, we must rise to the majestic heights of meeting physical force by soul force. So, of course, using Gandhi's term. So, the payback is reconfigured as the vindication of civil rights, a process that takes place in the future and which unites black and white in a quest for freedom and justice. Everyone benefits, as many white people already recognize, says King, quote, their freedom is inextricably bound to our freedom. King next repudiates a despair that could lead either to violence or to the abandonment of effort. Now it's at this point that the most famous section of the speech, the I have a dream section, takes flight. And of course this dream, though drawn from the Bible, is not drawn from the highly retributive book of Revelation. It's drawn really from Isaiah. And it's one not of torment or retributive punishment, but of equality, liberty, and brotherhood. In pointed terms, King invites the African-American members of his audience to imagine brotherhood even with their former tormentors. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, that state will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, with its vicious racists, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words interposition and nullification, one day, Right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. So there is anger in King's speech, at least initially, and the anger at first summons up a vision of rectification which takes naturally a retributive form, but King gets busy right away reshaping retributivism into work and hope. For how, sanely and really, could injustice be made good by retributive payback? The oppressor's pain and lowering do not make the afflicted free. Only an intelligent and imaginative effort toward justice can do that. So that's what I mean by the transition, capital T, a movement from anger with all its defects into forward-looking constructive thought and work. King did favor nonviolence, and so have many intelligent leaders. Sometimes, however, that strategy fails. Nelson Mandela records the gradual decision of the ANC under his leadership that violent strategies would have to be pursued. But notice that while urging ANC members to wake up to anger's call and even in a way sense it as a motivating force, 
and while authorizing certain sorts of violent guerrilla tactics, Mandela never failed to point to the transition, pointing people toward a future of cooperation rather than payback. Now it's here that I want to introduce an exception to my thesis that anger always involves conceptually a thought of retribution. Now there are many, many cases in which one gets standardly angry first, thinking about some type of payback, and then in a cooler moment, heads for the transition. But there are at least a few cases in which one is there already. Namely, the entire content of one's emotion is how outrageous something must be done about that. So let me call this emotion transition anger, since it is maybe anger or quasi-anger, but already heading down the third fork in Angela's road. Transition anger does not focus on status, nor does it even briefly want the suffering of the offender as a, an alleged payback for the injury. It never gets involved in that type of magical thinking. It focuses on social welfare from the start. By saying something should be done about this, it commits itself to a search for strategies, but it remains an open question whether the suffering of the offender will be the most appealing. Now this, if you want to sort of get a sense of what this is like, I think this sort of borderline anger is often felt by parents toward their young children. Namely, the children's behavior is often outrageous, and the parents are outraged, but they're not truly angry in my sense because they wish only good to ensue for the child. Now, what good can we say about the ordinary type of anger? Anger, I think, has a very limited but real utility, which derives very likely from its evolutionary role as a fight or flight mechanism. It may play three roles. First, anger can be a useful signal, a kind of wake-up call in the heart that something is badly wrong. Still, this signal has a lot of noise, given anger's connection to status. I mean, so maybe you feel angry because you've been lowered or something, but maybe nothing is really, really wrong. Second, anger can sometimes serve as a motivation that leads people to address real problems. Again, however, it may not be the most reliable motivation. King said he used the highly formal and limiting structure of the nonviolent protest, non protest march to discipline real anger and transform it into something that would prove governable and useful. Third, anger may be a useful deterrent. People refrain from transgressing against other people if they think those other people are likely to explode. Well, th that may be true, but it's not a very good way to relate to people in society, scaring them off from treating you badly by being ungovernable and violent. I know people like this, but they may simply achieve isolation and not good treatment. More generally, the way anger deters is not likely to lead to a future of stability or peace. Instead, it's all too likely to lead to a more devious aggression. And there are many ways of deterring wrongdoing, some of which are much more attractive than inspiring fear of an explosion. In any case, we may retain these limited roles for anger, instrumental roles, while insisting that its payback fantasy is profoundly misleading, and that to the extent that it does make sense, as it does in the case of relative status, it does so against the background of diseased values. The emotion, in consequence, is highly likely to lead us astray. What's the upshot for law? In my larger project, I ask first about everyday justice and then about revolutionary justice. Now, as far as everyday justice goes, the upshot is, I think, precisely what Jeremy Bentham and Plato before him thought. The constructive, forward-looking thought about how to deal with the whole social problem of wrongdoing is what should interest us, not the empty fantasy of payback. Punishment, if we end up using it, ought to compete for our attention with other strategies for preventing crime ex ante. And thus, the debate that obsessively goes on, that's called the justification of punishment, really ought to be about how punishment measures up at all 
to ex-ante strategies that a society can use to prevent crime. As Bentham emphasized, preventing wrongful acts is a complicated task, and we need to consider it in the broadest possible way, asking how nutrition, social welfare, education, employment, and a variety of constructive policies may contribute. He argued that focusing only on punishment ex post is actually highly inefficient if what one really wants is less offending. Often, he said, the same result can be attained, quote, as effectually at a cheaper rate, by instruction, for instance, as well as by terror, by informing the understanding, as well as by exercising an immediate influence on the will, end quote. At any rate, one must study the entire question. The failure of many societies, and I think probably my own more than any other, to consider punishment in the context of that larger inquiry into social welfare is a grotesque failure. It's as if parents stop thinking about education, nutrition, inspiration, and love to focus single-mindedly on harsh treatment of the bad behavior that would surely result from such neglect. Parents don't behave that way because they love their children and think of their well-being as part of the parent's own. Unfortunately, citizens do not always love their fellow citizens or think of their well-being as a part of their own. And that, I fear, is why modern societies, and mine in particular, have been willing to tolerate a pile-on-the-misery strategy as if it really made sense. Well, there's much more to be said about that, but no time here. So let me now turn to revolutionary justice, or return to it, since with King we're there already. Philosophers and non-philosophers alike have often seen anger as appropriate in situations of great oppression and as linked to the vindication of self-respect. It is then not surprising that non-anger in such situations should have struck many onlookers as strange, unmanly, even revolting. Consider the reaction of Webb Miller, the UPI correspondent, uh, American, I think significantly, who reported the nonviolent protest action organized by Mohandas Gandhi at the Darasana Salt Works in 1930. Miller observed scores of marchers getting beaten down by the police four by four all day. So they would march, a four would march, they'd be clubbed down, then they'd be dragged off to the side, then four more would come, and so on, all day long. And he reacted with perplexity, as he records in a later memoir. He writes, not one of the marchers even raised an arm to fend off the blows. They went down like ten pins. From where I stood, I heard the sickening wax of the clubs on unprotected skulls. At times, the spectacle of unresisting men being beaten to a bloody pulp sickened me so much that I had to turn away. The Western mind finds it difficult to grasp the idea of non-resistance. I felt an indefinable sense of helpless rage and loathing, almost as much against the men who were submitting unresistingly to being beaten as against the police wielding the clubs. And this despite the fact that when I came to India, I sympathized with the Gandhi cause. Well. The marchers were not simply acquiescing. Miller could certainly see that. Their march was a demand and a protest. They continued to march, and they chanted the slogan, Long Live the Revolution. And yet, as Miller says, there's something in the mind, and not only the Western mind, because Gandhi's assassin said very similar things in his 150-page speech of self-justification, that resists accepting this way of reacting to brutal behavior. So what do Gandhi and King have to say to people who think that anger is the right response to oppressive behavior and the only response consistent with manly self-respect? First, they point out that the stance they recommend is anything but passive. Gandhi initially allowed the term passive resistance to be used in English translations of some of his speeches because he, at that time, didn't speak English very fluently. But by 1907, already, he had explicitly repudiated that translation as misleading, 
And both he and King continually insisted that what they recommend is a state of mind that is highly active, even in King's words, dynamically aggressive, in that it involves resistance to unjust conditions and protest against them. But when I say we should not resent, I do not say that we should acquiesce, says Gandhi. For King, similarly, quote, I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. Both men hold, as I do, that anger is inherently wedded to a payback mentality. Gandhi says, resenting means wishing some harm to the opponent, if only through divine agency. King similarly speaks of a strike back mentality. So that's what they want to get rid of, and we'll soon see with what they want to replace it. Moreover, the new attitude is not just internally active, it issues in concrete actions with one's body, actions that require considerable courage. King calls this direct action, action in which after what he calls self-purification, that is getting rid of anger, one's own body is used to make the case. This action is a forceful and uncompromising demand for freedom. The protester acts by marching, by breaking an unjust law in the deliberate demand for justice, by refusing to cooperate with unjust authority. The goal, in King's case, to force negotiation and to move toward legal and social change. For Gandhi, it's no less than to overthrow a wrongful government. The idea of acquiescence in brutality is presumably what revolted Webb Miller, but he just misunderstood. There's no acquiescence. There's a courageous struggle for a radical end. So what's the new attitude with which they propose to replace anger? King, interestingly, as I mentioned, allows some scope for real anger, holding that demonstrations and marches are a way of channeling those emotions uh, and stopping them from leading to violence. Nonetheless, even when initially there's real anger, it must soon lead to a focus on the future with hope and with faith in the possibility of justice. Meanwhile, anger toward opponents is to be transformed into a mental attitude that carefully separates the deed from the doer, criticizing and repudiating the bad deed, but not imputing unalterable evil to people. Deeds may be denounced. People always deserve respect and sympathy. After all, says King, the ultimate goal is, quote, to create a world where men and women can live together. And that goal clearly needs the cooperation of all. Above all, then, one should not wish to humiliate opponents in any way or wish them ill. Instead, one should seek their friendship and cooperation. Gandhi remarks that early in his career, he already felt the inappropriateness of singing the second stanza of God Save the Queen, which asks God to scatter her enemies and make them fall, confound their politics, frustrate their knavish tricks. How can we assume that these opponents are knavish, says Gandhi? Surely the believer in non-anger should not encourage such attitudes. The opponent is a person who has made a mistake, but we hope he can be won over by friendship and generosity. But since, certainly ever since Mandela's recent death, we've been thinking of him and his ideas a lot, and since his ideas played a formative role in my own thinking even before his death. So let me conclude with that example. So I've argued that anger leads down two paths, each of which has an unattractive error built into it. Either anger's wish for ill to befall the wrongdoer is pointless, since payback does no good for the important elements of human flourishing that have been damaged, or remains focused on relative status, in which case it may possibly succeed in its aim, relative abasement, but the aim itself is singularly unworthy. I'll now try to show that Mandela instinctively comes to the same conclusion, in a way informed by his study of Gandhi, but much more shaped by his own life experience and his long period of self-examination during his 27 years in prison, a time that he says was extremely productive in meditating about anger. 
And I should mention that only about three years ago, it came to light that there was a manuscript of Marcus Aurelius's meditations in the prison on Robben Island. The Indian uh, convict uh, Ahmad Katrada, very close to Mandela, had smuggled it in. And so when later, Mandela does allude to Marcus Aurelius in uh, titling a, a book of conversations, Conversations with Myself. He, uh, he probably was referring to a much earlier formative role. Okay, so what did Mandela realize in those long hours of what he later calls conversations with myself, where he explicitly says he's patterning himself on Marcus Aurelius? First, he recognized, he says, that obsession with status is ubiquitous but unworthy, and thus refuses to go down that road, although he uses his understanding of that tendency to help him relate to others. As for the wish for payback, he says he understands it very well and feels it deeply in his own life, but he recognized, he tells us, that payback simply doesn't get you anywhere. Maybe at some level there's a choice between anger and non-anger in the sense that wrongdoing might understandably ground either response. But if we ponder the sheer futility of the payback wish, and if we actually want good for ourselves and for others, we quickly discover that non-anger and a generous disposition are far more useful. Above all, says Mandela, they are certainly more useful for the person who's the fiduciary of a nation. To put it in a nutshell, a responsible leader has to be a pragmatist. So echo echoing the introduction, which uh, I love for its references to my friend and teacher, Hilary Putnam. So a responsible leader has to be a pragmatist, and anger is incompatible with forward-looking pragmatism. It just gets in the way. A good leader must move to the transition as rapidly as possible, and perhaps for most of his life, just stay there. A good summary of Mandela's approach can be found in a little parable that he told to his interviewer, Richard Stengel, as one that he had often used with his followers. So here's how it goes. I told the incident of an argument between the sun and the wind, that the sun said, I'm stronger than you are. And the wind said, no, I'm stronger than you are. And they decided, therefore, to test their strength with a traveler who was wearing a blanket. So we could all go out and do this test today. And they agreed that the one who would succeed in getting the traveler to get rid of his blanket would be the stronger. So the wind started. It started blowing, and the harder it blew, the tighter the traveler pulled the blanket around his body. And the wind blew and blew, but it could not get him to discard the blanket. And as I said, the harder the wind blew, the tighter the visitor tried to hold the blanket around his body. And the wind eventually gave up. Then the sun started with its rays, very mild, and they increased in strength. And as they increased, the traveler felt the blanket was unnecessary because the blanket is for warmth. And so he decided to relax it, to loosen it, but the rays of the sun became stronger and stronger, and eventually he threw it away. So, by a gentle method, it was possible to get the traveler to discard his blanket. And this is the parable, that through peace, you will be able to convert, you see, the most determined people, and this is the method we should follow. So, significantly, Mandela frames the entire question in forward-looking pragmatic terms as a question of getting the other party to work with you. He then shows that this task is much more feasible if you can get the other party to sort of cooperate rather than resisting. Progress is impeded by the other party's fearful defensiveness and anxious self-protection. Anger, consequently, does nothing to move things forward. It simply increases anxiety. A gentle approach, by contrast, can gradually weaken defenses until the whole idea of self-defense is given up. Mandela, of course, was not naive, nor was he so ideological as to refuse reality. Thus, I think we would not find him proposing, as Gandhi actually did, to drop armed resistance to Hitler or to try converting Hitler by persuasion. His parable is offered in a particular context, that of the ending of a sometimes violent liberation struggle, with people on the other side 
many of whom are genuine patriots, wishing the future good of the nation. He insisted from the start of his career that nonviolence should be used strategically. Still, behind the strategic and brief resort to violence was always a view of people that was transitional, focused not on payback, but on the creation of a shared future in the wake of outrageous and terrible deeds. Two famous examples show Mandela checking the demands of his ANC comrades for payback in the service of reconciliation. The first is the example of rugby, known now through the excellent film Invictus, based on John Carlin's book, which is even actually better than the film. The ANC voted to decertify the rugby team as an official term team of the nation in an attempt, not incomprehensible at all, to punish the racist white rugby community, since rugby at that time was almost exclusively a white sport. Mandela understood the strategic importance of sports for reconciliation, and so he set out to form a friendship with the team's captain and the other players, in the process also getting them to offer rugby clinics in the townships so that by now rugby is far less of an all-white sport. The celebration of the World Cup victory was the culmination of this long strategic campaign. And when the huge crowd chanted in unison Mandela's name, the future of the nation was one big step further on. The second and closely related example was that of the national anthem. The ANC had voted to substitute their freedom anthem in Cosi Sikalele Africa for the old Afrikaans anthem, Die Stem. Mandela saw that this would impede a future of reconciliation. So he proposed, and he got his party to accept, the version that is now sung, in which the two anthems are put together with the final stanza in English. So it's actually more complicated because Nkosi is sung in three different African languages, then we have Die Stem in Afrikaans, then we have the English. In both of these cases, payback was very natural and very easy. Mandela preferred a more devious and difficult course. Although the ANC thought initially that their self-respect required payback, they later saw that a generous spirit was self-respecting and was far more useful for the nation. Let me end with just one more Mandela story, which shows him renouncing both the status error and the payback error at once. Mandela is talking here about an interaction with a white Afrikaner warder who watched him while he was in the transitional prison, Victor Vorster, prior to his official release. So Mandela was in three prisons. He was in Robben Island for most of the 27 years, then briefly in Palsmore Prison, which was much less bad and was transitional. But then Victor Vorster, after it was already clear that he was the next president of the nation, it was a kind of country club prison where he had his own personal cook. So this is the cook. So the warder, the jailer, is also his cook. So now the question is how the dishes would get done, a question in many households all over the world. And this is what he says. I took it upon myself to break the tension and a possible resentment on his part that he has to serve a prisoner by cooking and then washing dishes. And I offered to wash the dishes and he refused. He says, this is his work. I said, no, we must share it. Although he insisted, and he was genuine, I forced him, literally forced him, to allow me to do the dishes. And we established a very good relationship. A really nice chap, Warder Svart, a very good friend of mine. Now, it would have been so easy to see the situation as one of status inversion. The dominating Afrikaner is now doing dishes for the once despised ANC leader. It would also have been so easy to see it in terms of payback. The warder is getting a humiliation he deserves because of his complicity in oppression. Significantly, Mandela does not go down either of these doomed paths even briefly. He asks only, how shall I produce cooperation and friendship. It was this remarkable capacity for generosity and reciprocity that was Mandela's genius, the fruit, as he emphasizes, of years of critical self-examination on Robben Island. It's a difficult goal, but it's that goal that I'm recommending
for both individuals and institutions. Anger is a prominent part of most people's lives. I've argued that it lacks the virtues often claimed for it and has both normative and practical problems all its own. I hate, I hesitate, uh, not hate, but hesitate, uh, to conclude with a slogan that surely betrays my age, but I think it does really seem time to give peace a chance. Thanks. Thanks.